sanitation policies in the midst of an epidemic. Um, it's, uh, I published a CPR policy insight uh, on October 1st. And I will talk about this and uh, expand a little bit and uh, given the, maybe some new developments. So I'm uh, in terms of uh, the talk today, so I will talk about vaccination. And of course, uh, vaccination is a multi-step uh, uh, multi process. You first need to have a vaccine, which requires R&D. It requires authorization. It requires production. And uh, it requires the authorities to purchase the vaccine. Uh, then, as we say, uh, vaccines don't save lives. Uh, vaccination does. So you need a delivery system that makes sure that you can put the vaccines in the arms of citizens, and then uh, you also need to persuade them. Some will be eager to be vaccinated and others uh, uh, are much more reluctant. And of course, uh, we will spend a lot of time on the, the last part, persuasion, but I will quickly go through the uh, earlier part too and discuss uh, how different countries fare differently with these different aspects. And I will focus on uh, Western countries. So, as we all know, uh, this vaccine development has been a big innovation success, uh, but with a big global injustice so far. Indeed, uh, if you look, and I will just take uh, standard data from uh, All World in Data, uh, which updates things uh, every day. So today, 47.5% of the world population has received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, which is a big success. Uh, 6.65 billion doses have been administered globally. And these days we are around 20 million doses, uh, new doses every day. Uh, however, uh, only 2.7% of people in low-income countries have received at least one dose, and that is a huge uh, problem, which I will not discuss today because I will focus today on, on rich countries, rich Western countries, but uh, obviously uh, a lot is needed uh, on that front too. Now on R&D, uh, on uh, in September 2020, with Philippe Aguillon, with Sofia Amaral Garcia, and with Michel Goldman, we published a little VoxEU uh, piece arguing that uh, it would be good for Europe to, uh, to uh, imitate the US more on the R&D front. Uh, the US has a very impressive ecosystem with research universities, with the NIH, with BARDA, with biotechs and very efficient uh, financial markets for innovation with big pharma, uh, with the benefits of centralization uh, and the famous operation warp speed, including also the Defense Production Act where you can, you can uh, dictate what uh, private companies can do. Even the US Army uh, helped. Uh, last January, we had a very interesting uh, I3H webinar uh, with uh, Monsef Slawi, who was the chief uh, scientific officer of uh, Operation War Speed. He's also a PhD from, in immunology from ULB and spent a lot of time in GSK. Uh, so uh, it's on our website and uh, it, it explains very well how it all worked. By the way, uh, on authorization, the FDA played its part. It was dynamic, uh, by the way, the EMA and others also uh, in Europe and others uh, played their part too. And so authorization went well, it was fast and rigorous. Now, uh, not saying that the EU or the UK uh, don't have strengths. They also have good research universities. They have good biotechs like BioNTech. They have uh, big pharma, uh, but it's true that uh, there are some steps that are missing. In particular, uh, our budgets are still too much national. As we know, the EU is a regulatory giant, but a budgetary dwarf. So emulating the NIH would be a good idea. Uh, BARDA, uh, and that was the point of our uh, little paper with uh, Philippe, Sofia, and Michel, uh, needed to be emulated. By now, the health emergency uh, response authority in Europe has been set up. Will it be up to the job? Let us let us see. And it would also be nice to think of a European, uh, European 
Operation Warp Speed or Defense Production Act. Well, we don't even have a European army, so there are things, still things to do. But uh, but okay, uh, I think by now we the, the R and D phase for this uh, COVID nineteen vaccines that has been successfully uh, addressed. Uh, then uh, there is the issue of uh, being able to to purchase the vaccine. Uh, Israel, which was uh, world leader in the purchase of these vaccine, as we know, shows that you don't have to be involved in that R&D or in that production to, to get ahead. The price uh, simply needs to be right. And so they, uh, they paid, I think, four times what Europe paid, but uh, they got it fast. Uh, by the way, they also allowed the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, to analyze in detail the impact of vaccination on the Israeli population. So they contributed to, to global knowledge there. Um, so that's for, for Israel that managed to get it very fast. The UK and the US benefited from close links to AstraZeneca and Pfizer and Moderna respectively, in particular to accelerate purchases too. The EU uh, was not as efficient in terms of purchasing, uh, but they did achieve uh, intra-EU equity. And then when you look at uh, the numbers, I mean, the, the evolution here, what we have is the share of total population having received at least one dose. Of course, for most of these vaccines, you need two doses, but uh, I will focus here on getting people with at least one dose, because this is, as I will argue, the main element to think about vaccine hesitancy. The biggest hurdle is getting the, the first dose through. And what you see here, is that uh, indeed in terms of, uh, you have time on the horizontal axis and you have uh, on the vertical axis, the percentage of total population having received uh, at least one dose. And you see that uh, early on, Israel was really fast, then the UK, uh, then the US and Europe, the EU was slower. And the EU was criticized uh, in the first uh, four months or five months of the uh, of, uh, year uh, in terms of being, being too slow. Uh, now, before uh, going to Europe, uh, let us stress that in terms of production, uh, by now, uh, availability of uh, the, uh, the existing vaccine is not a problem anymore for uh, rich uh, countries in Europe and, uh, and, uh, and the US. The binding constraint is uh, getting uh, over vaccine hesitancy. So persuasion is the biggest problem. Uh, of course, production remains a big problem, a very, very big problem for poor countries. Uh, and that is uh, something to we would need a, a massive increase in, in production uh, fast. Uh, however, uh, even though, uh, even though uh, big, uh, rich countries have managed to buy these vaccine at pretty uh, low prices, uh, the, the question of future purchases, uh, booster shots, future doses, upgrade vaccine, uh, the issue of price and availability uh, is uh, are definitely not settled, as I will come back to. Uh, in particular, uh, I mean, this quote by the chief financial officer of Pfizer uh, is not really reassuring. Basically said to investors, it's always interesting to, to listen to, uh, to what uh, companies uh, tell investors because typically uh, that determines the stock price and the stock price determines how much uh, the CEO and the top management are paid. Basically, uh, Frank D'Amelio, CFO of Pfizer, said that uh, he expected its COVID vaccine margins to improve uh, because uh, until now they have charged uh, around uh, you know, $19.5 uh, per dose. But it's not a normal price. He said the normal price would be typically 150 to 175 dollars per dose, so not the same level. And so he said, yeah, what, right now we are doing pandemic pricing. So I think that uh, we have this 
paradox that uh, the EU Commission was criticized for uh, the slow delivery of COVID vaccine because it insisted too much on low prices for vaccines while the recessionary cost of delay was huge. Uh, and indeed, it's fair to say that uh, they probably um, did not take into account uh, the huge opportunity cost of uh, being too slow. On the other hand, I, I think we should definitely not uh, draw the wrong conclusion for, for what has happened. Indeed, in the midst of an epidemic, uh, you may want to pay a little bit more in order to get the, the, the vaccine more quickly. But the EU was quite wise to coordinate the bargaining at EU level. And it was very important, for example, for a country like Belgium because the EU intervened and said uh, we should have a fair distribution of vaccines across EU countries. Uh, and that was uh, a comment they made at a time where some EU countries had decided to go alone, well, to go alone together, in particular four countries, Germany, France, Italy, and the Netherlands had started to bargain uh, as a quatuor with uh, big uh, pharma companies. Uh, or with uh, Moderna, which is not a big pharma, but uh, a biotech company. Uh, and uh, I think the fact that the EU uh, decided to coordinate and to go for a fair distribution of vaccines across EU member states was, I think, uh, very helpful, even though it costs a bit of, uh, a bit of delay. Um, now, my worry is that people will say, well, you know, uh, it's okay to, uh, to pay high prices for vaccines. So look at uh, what happened uh, in the first semester in 2021. Uh, I do think that especially given uh, Frank D'Amelio's comment, uh, we should keep in mind that in a steady state, the price of drugs is an issue and it will depend on our bargaining power. And uh, so keeping the idea of uh, EU bargaining on the one hand and making sure we have enough options on the other hand is I think relevant. In this sense, I, uh, even though there is this view that indeed uh, mRNA vaccines are better than the AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson varieties, the idea to drop them all together, as I understand the commission has decided to do, uh, from future purchases, uh, let us face it, uh, well, let's hope it does not underestimate the value of competition. Because let's face it, uh, quite a number of people uh, uh, have been administered these AstraZeneca doses, and uh, we were told that uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty good. And I do think at this point, uh, while mRNA vaccines have uh, really uh, big, big uh, advantages. Uh, I think uh, making sure that we have a proper bargaining on prices in the future is I think relevant. So um, that's all I wanted to say about, uh, about prices and production and R&D. Uh, let me now focus on uh, the, uh, the other, the last two steps, delivery and persuasion. Uh, Israel was great not only at buying the stuff early, but also at delivering it very fast. Uh, they have faced hurdles on uh, persuasion, as we will see uh, in the next uh, slides. Uh, the US, uh, again, has been uh, good in terms, of, uh, in terms of organizing the delivery system, but uh, is uh, poor on persuasion, and in particular there, it's a country where, um, where the politicization, politicization of, uh, uh, of vaccination has become really important. So the Republican Party, uh, so parts of the Republican Party are, are kind of uh, arguing against vaccination. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, a problem. Of course, we know that mask is also being politicized. So the problem, US has the problem. Europe, uh, Western Europe in particular, uh, and I know that in some East European countries it has been more, more complicated, but uh, due to 
lack of time, I will not spend much time on that. Uh, Europe has less of this politicization problem as the US. And uh, in fact, uh, like in Israel and the US, uh, delivery has been uh, pretty good. Of course, the fact that the vaccine came less quickly made delivery uh, more uh, easier. But when you see here, so this is the earlier slide where we showed that uh, Europe uh, as a whole uh, was slower. Now here, let me uh, look at a couple of countries that I will focus on uh, later on. In particular, uh, I think there is uh, Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, Belgium, Germany, Denmark, uh, and Portugal. Uh, what I want to stress in this picture is that, as you see, uh, the uh, until June, uh, early June, you see that most countries go at the same rate. Uh, so, uh, which indicates that they are able to deliver uh, vaccines to people who are willing to be vaccinated. Uh, however, starting in June, you see some, uh, some uh, increase in variance and significant increase in variance. And basically the first period is the one where uh, every country is setting up the system and basically vaccinating volunteers. And they started, and it was a good idea to start with the most fragile people. But then you, if you have fewer volunteers, well, you go down the list of risks and you vaccinate more people. Uh, the problem comes when you hit the persuasion constraints and there uh, it is becoming more, uh, more complicated. So uh, as I say, delivery went well, just like uh, R&D, just like authorization, just like production for rich countries. Uh, the question now ahead of us still, some countries less than others is persuasion. So uh, let me uh, discuss from now on this question of, uh, of persuasion. Uh, and I think one point I wanted to stress is that uh, it is a mess in a number of countries. It has generated a lot of controversies in some countries, less so in others. But uh, I think one of the big culprits was uh, the initial communication, which uh, in, um, in most countries uh, went uh, in two, uh, two statements. First, vaccination shall be a personal choice. And two, we plan to reach herd immunity and it's very important to get rid of this virus. Uh, and uh, people didn't really think about, you know, what if these two statements are uh, inconsistent? Uh, what if they are incompatible? Of course, you need to, dis to, de to uh, define herd immunity. Initially, people thought, well, 70%, given the R of the, the virus. But then when we went to uh, the alpha virus, which is more... Uh, uh, contagious, people talked about 80%, and now people are talking, epidemiologists are talking about 90% with the Delta variant, which has become uh, which has become dominant. So I think one of the big lessons of this crisis is that to say, you know, with limited uh, vaccine supplies and high uncertainty early on about side effects, let us start with volunteers to whom we are grateful because we will learn thanks to them. And then we will fine tune the strategy along the way while trying to accommodate legitimate vaccine fears as much as possible. Uh, I don't think what would have been lost by saying that instead of these uh, statements, uh, which uh, <laughs> meant we were looking for trouble. Uh, in a way, this statement, I, that vaccination is a personal choice, was in a sense quite surprising coming after a year 2020, where so many individual rights were constrained, uh, more so than since uh, 1945, uh, and also very unequally so. 
because you know some occupations are risky and others are less risky. So on the right to work, on the right to be educated, on the right to circulate, on the right to meet in groups, uh, basically people were hit with many constraints or their individual rights were severely constrained. Uh, even though, of course, uh, every country was trying to have some proportionality in balancing uh, individual rights and concerns, individual rights concerns and public health concerns for, for each measure. Um, so authorities could have said, should have said from the start, well, we will also uh, apply the same cost-benefit analysis uh, with vaccination. We know vaccination uh, is something that some people don't like. Uh, there are some risks, but there are benefits. Uh, they are the, uh, the main way to overcome the epidemic. They are very cheap. So basically, uh, cheap, of course, for rich countries. Uh, so we could have done that. Uh, so I think there, uh, all countries could have done better. Uh, this is not to say that the vaccination strategy was uh, all wrong. It had clear merits. Uh, in particular, this idea, let's start with volunteers and see what goes on. Uh, in fact, interestingly, it echoes a debate uh, you know, on a completely different topic uh, 30 years ago about the transition from a centrally planned economy to a market economy, both in China and uh, in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And in fact, interestingly, with uh, my then colleague, Gérard Roland, in Berkeley, we argued that in an uncertain environment, when you are faced with this idea of doing this transition, it's an advantage to start first with more efficient and popular transitional measures and thereby potentially build momentum for further reforms once people see that these reforms work. And that's exactly what was done here. Let's start vaccinate the more fragile individuals whose benefit from vaccination is higher and individuals eager to be vaccinated. So the more efficient and the more popular uh, parts of the uh, uh, the the parts of the population for which the measure is more efficient and or more popular. And then if vaccine turns out to be efficient and safe, which has been the case, this will build uh, a virtuous circle to vaccinated people who have gradually been convinced to get vaccinated. Uh, and I think the numbers show that it works, uh, as you will see later on. I mean, the vaccine hesitancy has gone down for part of the population. And so one advantage of this voluntary vaccination strategy is that it maximizes the number of people who get vaccinated happily, can I say so. The problem, of course, is what if one does not reach the desired vaccination target just in this way? Uh, so the debate, it started uh, very early on in some countries. Uh, uh, the corona passes uh, were were imposed in Israel and Denmark very quickly. But so the general debate about uh, should we have carrots, should we have sticks, should we have mandates has been with us uh, for quite some time. And uh, the debate has, uh, has, uh, can be divided into two different questions. One, is it uh, ethically acceptable to uh, have carrot sticks or mandates uh, while we said early on that it would be an individual's choice. Is it a betrayal of that earlier promise? Even though, as I argue, this was a somewhat careless promise. Is it a discrimination between the vaccinees and the non-vaccinees? Is it an invasion of privacy? You know, big brother. Is it an unacceptable delegation of social control to citizens. You want to go to a restaurant, uh, you need to tell about your health uh, uh, characteristics, uh, uh, the owner about your vaccination uh, for risk. Uh, all these points are, I think, relevant. They, of course, have to be balanced against public health concern. Uh, I will not say much on this here. Uh, there is a debate. Uh, the, uh, some people could argue that an economist is not the best place to hold uh, that debate. We need to uh, talk to ethicists, uh, to 
philosophers and so on. But uh, let me focus on the, the other part of the debate, which I think is much more empirical. Uh, is it going to work? You know, let's assume we put aside these, uh, these uh, kind of uh, worries and stress the public health advantage and the, uh, and the economic advantage and everything. Uh, and the fact that it's, uh, these vaccines are cheap for rich countries. Uh, the question is, if we introduce a carrot, a stick, or a mandate, uh, will it increase vaccination? And there, I think there has been a quite interesting uh, evidence, survey evidence uh, from uh, various disciplines, but in particular psychologists. And in, uh, let me, for Belgium, uh, let me recommend the motivation barometer, which is uh, 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 a set of psychologists uh, looking at uh, week after week uh, how uh, the evolution of not only vaccination and vaccination attitudes, but uh, also uh, attitudes towards uh, non-pharma intervention and all that. And then also a more multidisciplinary project uh, in the, particular the University of Antwerp with the Great Corona Study. Uh, and there, uh, there have been findings over the months about uh, the fact that uh, while vaccinees are quite open to, uh, in particular, sticks, uh, non-vaccinees uh, are not. Uh, at some level, you could say it's not that surprising, but it is true that, you know, uh, if um, the idea here is to reduce the risks of the epidemic and also to increase vaccination, What's the point of doing, um, of enacting a policy uh, where uh, vaccinees will applaud, but the others uh, will say, no way, I, this won't change my, my behavior. Um, this being said, by now, uh, many countries have moved away from pure freedom and quite a number of countries, I saw in Le Monde, they were mentioning uh, 27 European countries, well, EU and non-EU, uh, where in particular the corona passes or the COVID safe ticket uh, has been introduced. As I said, Israel and Denmark were pioneers, but they, uh, countries like Germany, Austria, Luxembourg, uh, France, Portugal, Italy, Netherlands, uh, they have uh, introduced them. Uh, typically, uh, well, they follow a bit the um, the uh, European, uh, because it was introduced also early on for uh, cross-border movements in, at European level. And typically, uh, it's not a vaccination pass because it's either vaccination or a negative test, recent enough, or uh, a proof of prior infection, recent enough also. But, you know, a test is more like 48 to 72 hours and prior infection is more like uh, six months because it, it depends on... Uh, the, uh, the length of which uh, you are protected. Now the perimeter differs uh, across countries, but generally it's targeted towards leisure activities. So not work or education, uh, and it's typically risk-based. So uh, you see it most for big events, then for nightclubs, then for uh, restaurant cafes, sports and culture, just like uh, the, uh, the hierarchy or the timing of uh, non-pharma intervention, which is also following this, because we have reasonably good idea of what is a riskier or less risky activity. Uh, countries to watch, though, are Italy and the US that have very recently started requiring corona passes also for work and education. And uh, so that will uh, be interesting to, to keep an eye on. Uh, but uh, as I say, by now, uh, the Corona passes for leisure activities. It's something that, uh, that uh, we can uh, have a look at because a number of countries have, uh, have looked at that, have introduced that. Now here in this short paper, which is not at all a, a proper uh, natural experiment methodology uh, and so on, but uh, the idea is still, well, let's look for example, at this French experiment, uh, which was, uh, which is a clean one in the sense that it was announced very solemnly by uh, President Macron 
on July 12 on the TV channels, you know, the way the, the French do it, uh, with a clear timeline, uh, Corona Pass requirement in cinemas and media as of July 21st, in Oreca establishment on, from July, August 9th, and with a clear target, let's try and reach uh, 75% first dose by uh, end of August. Now, interestingly, uh, that uh, experiment had a big immediate effect, even more than what the supporters uh, uh, were expected, expecting. Uh, by the way, uh, this was decided not, well, it was decided by President Macron, but it was, it came from the scientific community, yeah? uh, basically uh, epidemiologists and, uh, and virologists had uh, basically recommended this to, to the president. Now, uh, after his announcement, his solemn announcement, uh, almost 1 million vaccine appointments uh, were uh, taken within 24 hours and this in uh, mid-July. Yeah? So, and uh, the next figure shows, as you will see, the, the uh, impact on first doses, daily first doses. Uh, what I will then look at is uh, take France in uh, comparison with other countries. Uh, I will focus on uh, the pre-enlargement Europe, so-called EU15, which is now EU14 plus the UK, because the UK has left uh, Europe, but uh, we also look at the UK, the US and uh, Israel. So this is the, uh, by the way, all the figures come from the database, all world in data, except this one. This one is from the French uh, Ministry of Health and uh, it shows uh, the uh, daily doses. In blue, the daily first doses, which I've argued is what we should look at to look at vaccine hesitancy and then the, uh, the total uh, daily doses, so which is uh, the blue curve plus second dose and even at the end, uh, uh, third dose, uh, because they have started. I think the key thing to look at is the, the blue curve. And what you see are two things. First of all, uh, the, uh, there was this peak at around uh, 400,000 uh, daily first, first doses uh, a day uh, in uh, at the uh, around May 20th and then it started going down uh, the um, it stopped going down and it became roughly horizontal already at the end of June this is because they were starting to uh, to vaccinate uh, teenagers uh, but what you see also is that there was a big uptick uh, after uh, mid July which lasted uh, until early August, and then it gradually went down. But of course, uh, the, it only reached uh, the level of, uh, of the end of June in mid-August. And uh, in fact, so you see a clear effect of that policy. And uh, you will also see that uh, the ranking of France will improve quite a lot uh, over that period. So let me uh, give you uh, two, um, two figures about, uh, about the rankings. Uh, as I say, EU14 plus UK plus uh, Israel plus US. And let us first look at uh, July 12, uh, so the day of the announcement. And you see that the reason why France did this announcement is that it next to the last country at 54% first doses, uh, of which 38% uh, fully vaccinated. So 54% was clearly not good. Their hope was 75% uh, by the end of August, so in a month and a half. Uh, so in these countries, uh, Greece uh, was the only country uh, behind, uh, behind France. The US was not great uh, because they were already hit by the, let's say, the vaccine hesitancy problem or ceiling. Uh, on the other hand, the UK and Israel were in the top three uh, together with the Netherlands. Belgium was number four. And, uh, you know, we were very proud of ourselves uh, and rightly so because uh, it was working. Um, 
Now, interestingly, if you move now to uh, September, the end of September, uh, and in the, the paper, I also look at uh, uh, where we were at mid August and to disentangle the two uh, sub periods, but uh, because a lot of things happened in that mid July, mid August uh, situation. But what you see in um, in at the end of September, and not much has changed uh, since, is that uh, the, the top countries are not the same anymore. Uh, it was uh, UK, Israel, and the Netherlands. Now it's Portugal, Spain, and Netherlands. Yes. yes. Michael Pisania here. Uh, I was wondering if you had the demographics of the uh, peak, uh, second peak in first doses in France, and if you could compare that uh, in other countries. So basically, are the youth reacting or the middle-aged? Um, all that is on the website of the uh, Ministry of Health, or uh, equivalently, the, uh, there is a corona tracker uh, which takes its uh, its data from there. What you see is that uh, the impact has been uh, at all age groups, and the more so, the lower the initial vaccination rate. So youngsters, it has a bigger impact than uh, older people. Uh, but you had an impact on all age levels. You also had an impact on... Uh, on uh, different communities, for example, uh, the uh, uh, because some people have said, look, you know, uh, in Belgium, the lowest vaccination rate is in Brussels, but Brussels is complicated. You have uh, poor neighborhoods and the like, uh, even though, by the way, even in rich neighborhoods in Brussels, uh, it doesn't look great. Um, but uh, in France, for example, you can see that um, in Saint Denis, which is a, a poor uh, uh, department, the banlieue of, of Paris, the effect was quite big. Uh, today they are at 82 uh, percent. Now Paris, uh, Paris in Tramuros is even better at 89, but uh, the impact has been bigger in uh, the neighborhood, uh, the richer one. So it's it's all across the. Uh, all across it. France is in fact a much more uh, homogeneous country as far as vaccination goes than Belgium, because Belgium, of course, as I will argue, I mean, know that uh, Belgium is not bad. Uh, 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 it was number four, it's now uh, number eight, but still it's, uh, it's roughly at 75%, so it's okay. But of course, it has big, uh, big differences uh, among regions. Okay, so where are we in, uh, in, uh, at the end of September? Uh, as I say, the, uh, the top three is now uh, Portugal, Spain, Denmark. But in fact, as you see, uh, well, Portugal is really <laughs> very, very impressive at 88%. Uh, given that it's out of total population and you don't vaccinate uh, people below 12, that means uh, I think of the eligible population, they are at 98%. So uh, this is quite, uh, quite amazing. I'll come back to that uh, a little bit. Then you have Spain, which is at uh, 80 or 81%. Uh, I, I can't see my whole, uh, <laughs> uh, because of the little picture, my little photo. Uh, but, uh, and then you have a number of countries uh, from Denmark to, uh, to Belgium that are between 74 and 77%. And then it goes down a little bit. You see the UK, Netherlands, it seems that they, the, the numbers have been updated and they are now uh, in that group with Belgium and the like. Um, and then it goes down. You see that indeed the UK, uh, Israel, the US are not great still, but uh, at the same time, uh, Germany, Luxembourg, Austria, Greece are not great either. Um, so I think that um, uh, to summarize these two, Figures we can say one some countries peaked early uh, because uh, they had uh, for the UK and Israel they had more vaccines uh, more quickly. Uh, the Netherlands was pretty good, but somehow they uh, they uh, they also peaked early a little bit. Um, France uh, 
has been very impressive, going from 54% to 74%. Uh, so clearly, uh, the, uh, the policy did work. And I will argue that indeed, uh, it's, uh, it is connected to the policy. Um, but uh, it's also true that you don't need to have this policy in order to do well. Uh, Spain is even better than France, and it also had a 20% increase over that period, just like France. Um, and uh, there was no Corona Pass because interestingly, uh, the Sanchez government tried to introduce it, but courts blocked it. Uh, by the way, Spain seems to be a country where uh, courts are very politicized, like, uh, like in the US, and uh, courts that are you know, uh, quite uh, uh, conservative, so that uh, it was not a good idea to allow the, the, the Spanish government to introduce that. So let's remember that in the regional election around Madrid, uh, the, the person who won, uh, from the Popular Party was explicitly um, anti-measures, and so. But, but from from a scientific point of view, it's interesting that France and Spain are quite a contrast, and they have the same uh, increase. Uh, of course, the best performer by far is Portugal, with an increase of twenty-seven percentage point uh, in uh, these two and a half months. So, uh, and now they are ahead of uh, second place Spain by eight percentage points. By the way, they introduced the uh, Corona Pass roughly at the same moment as, uh, as France. But I think the view when you look at the, uh, what the press says about Portugal is that this was less important than in France. Uh, the, what they credit Portugal for is the fact that uh, they, and I don't know whether we like it or not, but uh, the Portuguese government, which by the way is a left-wing government, put a military in charge of the, uh, the um, vaccination. Uh, and uh, so politics stay out of it. It was quite consensual from a political point of view. Uh, it was centralized, well-organized, and it seems that moreover, uh, one advantage of Portugal is that their anti-vax movement is very weak. Um, but uh, so this is, uh, so, so I think there Portugal is somehow in between Spain and, and France. Uh, the Corona pass was less important than in France, but of course it was introduced unlike, uh, unlike Spain. Finally, uh, a number of countries where uh, the Corona Pass has been introduced over time are not impressive. Germany, Austria, and Luxembourg all have a version of the Corona Pass, uh, but it hasn't been sufficient to, uh, to be in the, uh, the good performers. Finally, on this issue of uh, could the Corona Pass generate an aggregate backlash, so people were hesitant, becoming mad at uh, uh, the states uh, trying to uh, twist their arm in contrast to earlier promises. Well, it turns out that uh, we don't see, at least in the aggregate, a backlash. I thought the speaker also from our world in data is quite, uh, quite impressive. Uh, so every uh, 15th of the month, and they don't yet have the October 15 uh, data. But so in the last one, two, three, four, five, six, the first nine months of the year, you, uh, you see um, what, uh, I mean, the population is divided into four groups. Those who are vaccinated in dark blue, those who are not yet vaccinated, but plan to be vaccinated in, the, in light blue, then those who are not vaccinated yet and are uncertain about uh, becoming vaccinated in uh, orange or salmon. And then uh, those who are unvaccinated and don't plan to be vaccinated. And you see, as, as well known, early on, France was in fact a, a country where you had a lot of 
vaccine resistance. 45%, in fact, in mid-January. And uh, in, uh, in mid-June, uh, you still uh, have, uh, I think, 30%, uh, no, 40% of uh, people who don't plan to be vaccinated. And that has uh, been, uh, that has been reduced to uh, slightly less than 20%. The, the numbers are in the, are in the paper. So you see that in fact, uh, since, um, since June, uh, quite a number of people have decided that are not against vaccination anymore. Uh, and I think that the comparison with Germany is, is interesting. Germany started out with only 30% of people who don't want it to be vaccinated, but they are still uh, these days also around 20%. So there you don't see uh, any uh, reduction in the proportion of people being uh, against vaccination. And uh, so in that sense, I think the French experiment, uh, even though it's not a proper causality analysis a la uh, Card uh, and company, uh, I think the evidence is, is quite uh, robust. Now, moving away from just France, uh, let us, I think one thing which is impressive in the last uh, couple of weeks is how well Southern Latin countries have done because uh, France today is uh, the least good of the four, uh, but close to Italy. Yeah? Uh, but Portugal and Spain are pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, it's interesting that they do much better than Germanic countries. Uh, and that it's in sharp contrast with the overall performance within the pandemic uh, concerning the death tolls, because these four countries are above, uh, in terms of number of deaths per 100,000 inhabitants, they are above uh, these Germanic countries. So um, now, why exactly uh, have they done well so far uh, on vaccination? Uh, well, there is a correlation with uh, summer flare-ups, as uh, I'll show in, uh, in a second. Uh, they have, and it's partly tourism, but they have uh, had uh, increase in infections. And typically, these kinds of things uh, help focus the minds of both politicians and the population. Uh, indeed, we see that vaccination goes up when, uh, when infections go up. Uh, Portugal I have already mentioned. So you see here the uh, biggest flare-up. So that's uh, over the, the summer, the, uh, the number of cases uh, per capita. And you see that there was this big uh, wave uh, in, in Spain uh, in red, and then in blue around the same time, uh, and it started earlier, quite a wave also in, uh, in Portugal. And then the, the third one uh, is France. Uh, that was also uh, uh, starting uh, around mid-July. They had a wave too. Well, it could have been predicted because you see that uh, it started going up uh, earlier. Um, and uh, indeed, these three countries uh, had their mind focused by, um, by uh, these problems, while governments from other countries uh, could maybe go on holiday or or prepare for elections like in, in Germany. Now, Italy is interesting because they are the ones where uh, they didn't have the, uh, the flare-up, but uh, they, uh, they, they are also doing reasonably well now, but it was also much more, much more gradual. Okay, now then um, about Belgium. Um, the specificity of Belgium is its regional heterogeneity. Flanders has today the vaccination rate of Spain, so number two behind Portugal. Wallonia is closer to Israel, and Brussels is in fact at 56%, trailing Greece uh, big time. Uh, by the way, the uh, German speaking community uh, is in between Wallonia and uh, Brussels. So interestingly, while uh, in Europe, the Latins are outdoing the Germans, uh, the Germanics uh, in Belgium is the opposite. Um, and I think it has to do with some uh, vaccination culture in Flanders in particular. 
Uh, and in Brussels, it has to do with the, uh, the fact that it's such a diverse uh, population and it's hard to uh, connect with quite a number of groups. Uh, so we have more than 100 nationalities and uh, the, uh, I think uh, the, uh, it, is, it is more complicated, obviously. Um, so I think it makes sense to have decided, as the authorities have done, to uh, have the Corona Pass in Wallonia and especially in Brussels, but not in Flanders. But uh, let's face it, um, the, uh, it's as I'll say in the next slide, while the Corona Pass can work, it's neither necessary, see uh, Spain and Flanders, it's also not sufficient, Germany and Austria. Uh, and unfortunately, until now, we haven't, we haven't seen any impact yet on vaccination numbers. We've been talking about uh, the Corona Pass for more than a month. Uh, we've introduced it uh, last Friday and uh, Brussels vaccination is progressing by a constant 0.1% a day. So 1% in 10 days since mid-August. It's amazingly flat. Uh, so clearly I think the, what the authorities should do now is to, uh, to complement uh, this Corona Pass with uh, intense communication, with proper enforcement. Belgium is not always good at enforcing uh, the laws and I think it's important to, to do it, to make sure that people understand that uh, this is uh, real. And I think uh, it would be worth also looking at complementary persuasion efforts uh, like, uh, you know, uh, helping people getting there, uh, kind of uh, possibly uh, there are some recent, uh, recent article about how uh, paying people modest amounts uh, of money can help with some of them. I think we should definitely not think of the uh, non-vaccinated as a homogeneous group. There are people who are dead against it, uh, but there are also a lot of people for, for whom it's... Uh, just inertia, uh, I can always uh, do it later and so on. And I think it has to do with uh, taking people by the hand. And I think it would so also help in order to, uh, to focus minds to announce a target or a set of targets with timelines. Uh, as we know in economics, uh, targets like inflation targets work. And uh, to, uh, the, uh, you know what gets measured gets done. Uh, so I think in France, they did all this. Uh, and I think it would be worth uh, looking at that very carefully. So general lessons, as I said, Corona passes can help, but are neither necessary nor sufficient. So complementary measures are important. And uh, I think in terms of communication, let me, uh, let me express um, an interesting piece uh, uh, by uh, a colleague psychologist uh, about how to properly uh, explain how, uh, uh, how to communicate all this and stressing the uh, we are all in the same boat idea. So Martin van Steenkisten and Omer van den Berger wrote a, an article in, the, in CNAC, which was also summarizing some of the insights of their motivation barometer. And... Uh, I think from the start, also for future pandemics, uh, it's important to, to just don't have a, a vaccine exception. Vaccination is one tool in fighting epidemics, a very important one, but just like non-pharma intervention, you need to, to look at them in a uh, consistent, rational way, balancing individual rights and health concern, public health concern, and that's the way to... Uh, to uh, make sure they can be a useful and not too controversial part of the uh, uh, of the uh, instrument set of instrument to, to fight the pandemic. So of course, some people will always be very much against it, but the question is to make sure that you can uh, convince those uh, who are uh, uh, susceptible to uh, convincing. And in any case, uh, there is still a lot we don't know about, um, about determinants of vaccination. Uh, and so we need more research. Uh, 
what else can a researcher do, uh, which has to be multidimensional and multidisciplinary. So thank you very much. done and the overview and in fact given uh, on the vaccination strategy uh, let me first express our uh, gratitude to Caroline for organizing this hybrid seminar it's the first time that we do it like this so it's uh, technically uh, a challenge <laughs> thank you Caroline uh, for our online audience please share your questions uh, for Matthias in the chat and then you'll be uh, able to ask your questions to Matthias yourself um, we have a first question coming from Mark Domes. Mark, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, Matthias, thank you very much for this very nice interpretation of the mass of data that you can find on the internet on the vaccination. My interest is rather in orphan drugs. So as you most probably know, orphan drugs are authorized by EMA for all EU member states, while the reimbursement is on the national level. Of course, this creates a difference in availability between the different EU member states. If you are born in Germany, you are quite lucky. Your orphan drug is reimbursed. But if you are born in a country more to the east of Europe, most probably it will not be reimbursed. So do you see a possibility in the way we purchase and pay for the vaccination to use that system to reimburse and pay for orphan drugs? Well, uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, your question, Mark. Um, the um, uh, I do think that, um, as I said, there is a bit of this paradox that uh, that the European Commission was uh, was criticised for uh, insisting on cheap drugs, while typically uh, people uh, complain about uh, excessively high prices of drugs. Um, as I say, it's something that is connected to the opportunity cost of these drugs, uh, which of course is not the same for, uh, for uh, if you're not in a pandemic. And of course, on top of that, uh, we are, uh, I mean, often drugs concern uh, only uh, small numbers of patients, which makes at some level, the problem of the, of the individual drug much more problematic, even though of course, the, uh, the total cost on the budget since it's multiplied by the number of patients, is less of a problem. Now, uh, I think the view that there is an advantage to, um, to bargain jointly is something I think is true. And by the way, is something that uh, Belgium does because you have the Benelux A uh, uh, institution where a number of countries, Benelux, plus I think Austria and, uh, and Ireland are bargaining together. Uh, so I think that is something which, in a sense, the European Commission has oh, imitated, uh, has yeah, imitated uh, for uh, for vaccine, and I think it is. No, a good like to... Then the problem of uh, uh, the different reimbursement and the like. I think that's a problem which uh, is indeed very important. There are rich countries and poor countries. Thank God for, uh, for Corona vaccines, it's not too much of a problem because uh, the prices are low, thanks to the fact that uh, also uh, there will be, uh, there are billions being sold. Uh, but in general, I do think that some, uh, the way to solve this uh, uh, would be to have a European health budget. Uh, with some cross subsidization between rich countries and poor countries, which I think would be a good idea. But of course, uh, as we know, uh, there, there is this insistence in Europe that we shouldn't have a transfer union. And uh, that remains a political hurdle. Uh, okay. But, uh, but I think, yes, I mean, uh, the in, and, and I think that the, the issue of uh, centralized bargaining 
at the EU is something which can help even if we do not solve the other problem of the transfer union. In that sense, I do think that we should uh, look at that, uh, this new episode and put it in contact in, in context of the um, of initiatives like the Benelux A uh, project, which is also being, I think, uh, imitated by other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Michel, you raise your hand. Can you uh, give your comments, please? Yes, I hope that it will work. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, it works. Yes, we hear, hear you. So, uh, Matthias, impressive overview, a number of important data. And I think that, I mean, there, there is a lot to be discussed. Um, so I will just restrict myself to perhaps four comments or, or remarks. Um, first, perhaps the, the difference between US and EU and when you question, you know, whether the new European agency era will be able to, to do what Barda and the Operation Warp Speed did, I am I'm not sure. I think the way it starts, it's with the commission in the lead. And what was very clear in the US is that the success was due to the fact that, you know, they create a very, very small uh, team uh, you mentioned Moslev Tawi, and there was uh, one other person who took, who could take rapid decision and we were not, I would say, constrained by bureaucracy and things like that. And the way ERA starts, I'm afraid that, you know, all the European bureaucracy will still be, um, you know, there. And this might indeed limit our capacities. The, the, the other point I would like to make is, um, I, I think that you, you should be careful in presenting the mRNA vaccine uh, as necessarily better than the adenoviral vectored uh, vaccine. I think the, the jury is still open. You know that recent data show that, for example, the waning of the immune response is much more rapid with mRNA vaccine than with the other vaccine. And I think that what had happened actually is the fact that especially the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine has not been developed the right way. I will not elaborate too much on this, but you know, it was really a complicated organization between the company and the Oxford University. And I think that just the clinical trials were not conducted the right way and this create a lot of confusion even after. But I would still be careful. And I think that people who were vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine should not have too much uh, concern. So we, we, we could discuss this at length, but it's it just a short comment that the picture is not so obvious. And also there are new vaccines coming, which actually might prove to be quite useful, especially as boosters. Um, the, um, the third comment I would like to make is uh, about when you, you talk about communication, uh, as you know ourselves, we really insist on education. And I think that for this pandemic, I'm not sure that we will really change so much the situation in terms of vaccine hesitancy. I think that we should really have a long-term view and, uh, and as you know, we, we try to be very active on this. I think the issue is to make our citizens uh, health savvy so that people from school are educated about you know, health issues, including how to prevent infectious diseases. Now, the, the last point I would like to make, which um, I think is, is also important related to vaccine hesitancy is that we, we will be facing two important challenges. Um, as you know, and I think that the, the, the figure that you showed um, showed this in Belgium, uh, you know, we have, uh, as we speak now, the number of cases is quite significant uh, or significantly increased. Obviously, most of these cases are mild, but still in terms of costs for the economy, people have to stay, stay at home. And um, I think it's a challenge because some people will say, look, uh, 
you promise us that with vaccination we are you know protected no issues and now we see that even completely vaccinated people can get the infection develop mild disease it's true but still it's an issue the, the other point and i will end on that is that um there is this uh, new drug which is coming, the molnupiravir, which is a drug which is developed by Merck. And, uh, you know, I think that some people might say, okay, look, you know, uh, I prefer to take this drug in case I'm infected than to, than to take the, the, the vaccine, which would really be the wrong thing to do. We have to to indeed convince people to get vaccinated. But I think that it might become more and more difficult for those reasons. I stop here with, with my remarks. Well, thanks a lot, Michel. Uh, I, uh, no, no, I, I fully agree. Uh, first of all, I mean, as you say, I mean, I don't know. Uh, you, you may be right about uh, Hera, uh, being engulfed in uh, bureaucracy, <laughs> Euro bureaucracy. Uh, let's hope not, but but indeed, uh, the uh, uh, it it is uh, a question which is worth uh, uh, contemplating. Uh, they may need to have, uh, even though uh, Hera is already about health emergencies. Uh, maybe uh, they should have uh, contingent mechanisms of, uh, of uh, very about emergency within an emergency, which I guess is uh, the uh, because of course there is always the danger of uh, of building an agency that in the end, even though it's about crisis, uh, when the crisis comes, uh, it may not work. So uh, I fully agree that this is a concern. Uh, on mRNA, you've of course said it much better than I could have. Uh, I, I agree with you that uh, that indeed, I mean, it seems that indeed that the evidence is not clear. In fact, what I was trying to argue goes a bit in, it's been forced a bit uh, with your comment. I, I was trying to argue that maybe uh, there was an excessive focus on mRNA vaccine. The Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has announced that they would not buy any more. From AstraZeneca, and indeed that means you have fewer, uh, fewer potential sellers, and therefore they have uh, more option to, uh, to raise the price. So I fully agree that uh, that uh, if on top of that, it's not clear that uh, mRNA is the best. Even more reasons to have uh, multiple sourcing, as we say in economics. Um, I also agree that uh, we need more communication on vaccines in schools and the like. Uh, of course, that's taking the long view. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, a lot of the vaccine hesitancy is in fact uh, among adults and therefore, uh, and therefore that's already a problem, but indeed everything that can be done uh, to invest in uh, vaccine savviness is, is a very good idea. Finally, I fully agree that, uh, that the fact that the number of cases is going up, and it is going up in the last couple of days uh, quite significantly in Belgium, but it has already uh, gone up quite, an, quite, some, uh, quite a lot in a number of other European countries. Uh, some people might say, haha, uh, indeed, uh, the uh, uh, that means that vaccines are not that efficient, even though I think by now people, I mean, the message has gone out that uh, vaccination reduces uh, what uh, uh, divide by 10 probability of being in the, uh, in the hospital. Um, now, the, the one thing where I would be a bit more optimistic is that you also see that when you have more infections, then uh, people are more worried and they think more seriously about the uh, risk of, uh, of uh, being infected without being vaccinated. But I fully agree that um, it, is a, uh, it, uh, it can be a challenge for a number of people. Also, uh, the more people that are vaccinated, uh, by definition, the proportion of people in the hospital that are vaccinated uh, goes up because uh, you have fewer and fewer unvaccinated people. 
Um, as for the treatment, again, I mean, the question is, uh, if you need treatment, that means that you're already in the hospital or whatever, or, or that you have serious symptoms, I guess, unless you, no. you manage to, uh, to give the, the treatment to everybody uh, from the first symptom on. Uh, it does, you know, uh, I guess uh, the fact that there are no treatment for uh, HIV and that it's then now become more something like uh, something like uh, diabetes, a chronic disease, and you don't die anymore. You do hear that some people indeed uh, have unprotected <laughs> sex. So that would be uh, that would be uh, something that, uh, that would happen indeed. There are a number of challenges. I fully agree. Thank you for all these comments. Thank you. We have a next uh, question coming from uh, Fabien Irkupitz. Uh, Hilde, I I'm sorry to interrupt. We are very fortunate to have Ivan Latem with us. So I think it would be nice if you could organize that he could at some point talk to us and tell us what he thinks, especially about this uh, new drug therapy. I think that he has an important comment to make. So please try to connect. Yes, Eve. that would be great. Yes, uh, perfect. Uh, I suggest that we get uh, Fabien first, and then indeed uh, we get to uh, Ifan Latin. Okay, hello, Matthias, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So you said that we are in a globalized world. Uh, you said that we are in the same world, but at the same time, we are in a globalized world. And as you mentioned, uh, we see that the vaccination rate in uh, the, the less developed country is, is very, very limited. And so my question is that uh, why do we focus so much on increasing uh, the vaccination rates in advanced economies and not in uh, trying to increase the vaccination rate in developing countries? In terms of cost-benefit uh, analysis, would not it be a better strategy? And then I have a second question is that we impose, in fact, the, the Corona Pass in some, um, for some activities like leisure activities, but are we sure that these are activities for which the risk of infection is the highest? For example, what about uh, the, at work? Is it not also a high risk of infection and we don't impose uh, a Corona Pass? Thank you, Matthias. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um... I, first of all, so and I, I could not hear you that well. So let me uh, try and uh, make sure that I understand. Uh, I understood the, what you said. So the first thing was looking at cost-benefit analysis. Why aren't we doing more to uh, to increase uh, vaccine availability in poor countries? Um, I fully agree with you that uh, it should be a no-brainer. Uh, I think that uh, the cost, given the low cost of, of vaccines, uh, the, uh, there is definitely no problem for uh, rich countries to to pay uh, to buy uh, if it were available to buy uh, 10 billion uh, vaccines doses. Uh, so. Of course, there is the issue here about availability. I think a big question is how can we boost uh, vaccine production uh, so that uh, there are these uh, extra 10 billion doses. Uh, I, my understanding is that it's not just about uh, patents. Uh, by the way, uh, the Serum Institute in, uh, in India has a deal with AstraZeneca and so they, uh, in a sense, uh, that's uh, that that's not a real problem. Uh, the problem is building enough uh, capacity so that uh, so that we can produce these vaccines. And by the way, I think we should. It's not. Uh, it is not. Um, the question is not allocating uh, scarce vaccines uh, because you know what can we expect uh, that democracies, uh, politicians. Uh, will favor those with the right to vote. So this idea of saying, look, uh, we shouldn't have a third dose in rich country before uh, having two doses in poor countries, this is just not realistic. Politicians won't do that. And by the way, uh, 
autocrats uh, don't either because they prefer uh, favoring uh, their population than the, than the others. Uh, so I think what is really needed is to boost uh, production. And, uh, and as I say, the money is uh, in a sense, uh, a side question. Uh, even though, of course, I mean, what we are seeing here is that, uh, that rich countries are taking a gamble. And I think, because uh, indeed this virus could come back for on us too. Huh? So we fully agree that uh, we need a lot more uh, on that front to make uh, these vaccines global public goods. Um, then on the I issue think... of uh, the Corona pass, I think that there are two elements. So you're saying, uh, uh, is it uh, targeted properly uh, towards risky activities? Uh, leisure activities are not necessarily the uh, risky, riskiest activity. I think, uh, first of all, uh, the, what I find striking is that the, uh, uh, the targeting of the Corona Pass is pretty similar to uh, the targeting of uh, non-pharma intervention. Uh, I think, uh, you know, business to business activities are less risky uh, from the point of view of contagion. Uh, than other activities and therefore uh, they were reopened the first uh, in uh, May 2020 and they were always open afterwards. And I think it's based on the fact that it's possible to organize these activities reasonably safely, except of course in some uh, activities like uh, meat packing and the like or or things where activities where you have um, where you have a lot of uh, promiscuity, uh, people are uh, just uh, one next to the other, so that has to be taken care of. And there, by the way, vaccine mandates would be uh, would be a good idea. Um, I think then uh, you know shops are less risky than uh, than uh, contact professions and uh, than restaurants and cafes, and it's even worse with. Um, inside you know uh, uh, health clubs or uh, or big events and these kind of things so in that sense i think uh, it is reasonably targeted uh, on the other hand of course there is the issue of whether it's essential or not so clearly for example in public transportation uh, you are facing risks but of course if you stop public transportation then uh, people cannot go to work anymore so i think the balance is is not unreasonable. Uh, also, from the point of view of ethics, uh, insisting on vaccination uh, for things that are uh, vaccination or testing and, and so on, uh, if uh, for essential activities is a bit complicated. So I guess there, there was this view, even though now Italy and uh, some sectors in the US are, are doing it. Huh? So it would be interesting to see. Uh, so. Personally, I find the Corona Pass a not unreasonable uh, compromise between uh, uh, health risks and uh, individual rights. So in that sense, I think uh, it, uh, it does make sense. Thank you. Much as being con <laughs> conscious of time, I really want to have this intervenance from uh, Ifa Natan, please, yeah. because you made a very interesting point in the in the chat, but not all uh, participants or the audience can uh, see what you your point. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias, for us for this talk. Very interesting, showing what was happening with the vaccine policy during the last months, showing that the last may become the first, if you can say so, and that there is no magic bullet uh, that's working everywhere. We see that with the Corona Pass, we see that was it was happening in, in France and, and, and other countries. What I put in the chat is about the remark of uh, Michel. Uh, Monipiravir is surely sorry, something that we, we wait for. We should be very happy if the, the phase three trials show the same thing than the phase two with a remarkable, remarkable um, potency against the virus and a, a big difference in the people treated uh, soon and the people not taking a treatment. The problem should be the price, for instance, and that's always the problem when you compare the price. In the United States, uh, Max Sharpedon should 
plan to sell one full treatment for a little bit more than $700, uh, which is 20 to 40 times the price of the vaccine. If you compare G&G or, um, or, or Pfizer or things like that, uh, they plan also to, to, to leave the, the, the possibility to poor countries, low or middle income countries, to produce a treatment for a lower price. But I don't think that Western Europe should be considered as a low uh, uh, countries in, in, in the budget. So I, I think we should, we should pay a, a lot of money for that. So it's the question about how to allow people to say, OK, I, I take the risk to be, to, be, to be infected. I don't take the vaccine. But I agree that my country pay for uh, several times more than the vaccine uh, for a treatment that is not perfect. Uh, the vaccine is not perfect, but the treatment is not perfect. So I think molnupiravir or other treatment are, are awaited, that's clear, but should not be the definitive solution. It should be a solution for the people that um, have the vaccine and don't react well to the vaccine, things like that, but should not replace the vaccine, at least the present time. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Eve. Um, I, uh, I mean, I agree with your comment. I don't know if Michelle wants to uh, uh, have a further comment. When no, uh, I think I was just thinking that this comment is very important. What I know is that Merck is already negotiating with, uh, you know, low and middle income countries so that they will be able to, to produce the drug as generics as much lower price, but this will be restricted to low and middle income countries. But uh, I think that the, this comment is, is really important about the price. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was happening also for HIV treatment yes. that's produced at very low price in India, for Africa, and so on. But the price for all countries remain high prices. So I think we shall have the same same uh, type of evolution for the treatment for, for COVID, for instance. I agree. Unfortunately, it's not happening for orphan drugs. Yeah. So Hilda is uh, reminding me that uh, we have one more minute only. And so she suggested I, uh, I thank everybody. Yes, and, I, I, uh, yes indeed. Do. Uh, maybe just one comment on uh, the budget of vaccine versus treatment. Of course, vaccine, the idea is to vaccinate at least 70% of the population, which means that uh, the total budget is 70% of the population times uh, the cost of a vaccine, uh, which is low, but still 70% of the population is a lot of people. While if uh, basically without being vaccinated, your probability of uh, being uh, infected is still pretty low, then of course this ex post uh, is uh, uh, expenditure, which is high, will concern only maybe 5% of the population. Uh, even though, of course, it will be difficult uh, when a person, an unvaccinated person goes to the hospital, they will get the command, haha, you uh, didn't want to get vaccinated and look, now you're costing us uh, 10 times. Um, but in the aggregate, uh, I think the fact that the, one of the reasons why the vaccine is not very costly is because it's sold in billions of doses. But... Uh, but indeed, it will depend on the proportions. Anyway, thanks to everybody. Uh, thanks for the great comments. And, uh, uh, I understand that we should stop. Yes, indeed. There are numerous questions that haven't been asked. We took your, uh, we took note of your questions and tran we'll transfer them to to Machas. In any case, uh, thank you, Machas, for your insights shared. Um, we, as usual, our seminar will be available on our I3H website and the slides will be shared with all those who participated. Our next seminar is planned on November 15, at the same time, of course, uh, and it will be hosted by Guillaume Kassan. Thank you very much for, share, uh, for uh, your attendance. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.